probably about five years ago now, a little bit more than five years ago, uh, I had the, the wonderful experience of, of going to Ireland. My oldest daughter, Lindsay, took me to Ireland uh, for, I don't know what it was, maybe 10 days or something like that. And it was this great experience, this great thing. And um, I loved Ireland. It didn't disappoint. I had always wanted to do that, always looked forward to it. But one of the things that was unique about Ireland and that I really enjoyed is there are sheep everywhere. <laughs> everywhere you drive, there's sheep. They're on the side of the road. They're in the middle of the road. They're just everywhere. And it's just a, um, a country where that particular type of agriculture is, is very big. I saw a well, part of a tour. We stopped at a place where we watched a shepherd with his sheep dogs herding sheep. And that was really cool. Um, and he had all kinds of sheep. I, I think he had every kind of sheep that there was, including Jacob's sheep, which have, which have that name um, because they come from Israel and are believed to actually be as old as that period of time when Jacob lived. Um, so that was all pretty cool. A lot of countries have sheep as a much bigger part of their lives and culture than we do here in America. I know we have some. I see them every time, every year when we go to the state fair um, and I watch them, me and the kids watch them being sheared. But I can't, I can't think of like the last time or if ever driving down the street, I saw, hey, look, there's a herd of sheep out there. <laughs> but it certainly was a big thing in Bible times. It certainly was a big thing in Bible times, and it's why the illustration of the shepherd and the good shepherd are so meaningful in the Bible to those that understand it. You can turn to John 10.10 10 this evening. We're going to read part of that chapter where Jesus Christ talks about being the good shepherd. But before we get there, I'd like to read you an excerpt from this little booklet called The Shepherd of All, the 23rd Psalm by George M. Lamza. By the way, if you want to know more about Lamza, there's a really informative um, preface in here. Whoever wrote it really did a lot of research about Lamza. The Shepherd. Sheep raising throughout the centuries has been, considered, has been considered the highest occupation in Arabia, Palestine, and Mesopotamia, where the people have little knowledge of agriculture and where life is simple. The desert dwellers depend on their sheep and camels for wool for tents and clothing, also for food and transportation. Thus, sheep and cattle are the chief economic resources. Butter and cheese are used as money for barter. Sheep raising is an occupation where greed, dishonesty, and crookedness are seldom found, and where sharing and hospitality prevail. In the field of endeavor, in this field of endeavor, Man deals not so much with material goods devised by his own mind and produced by the works of his own hands as with living creations through whom God's love and his divine care for his children are so generously manifested. Sheep are gentle. They hardly resist their natural enemies when attacked. They tenderly mother their offspring and search for them in the flock to nurse them. Sheep know their owners and those who love them, especially the shepherd who is with them daily and who calls them by name. Helpless as they are, they put their trust in the shepherd who feeds them, protects them, and guides them. God is often pictured in the Bible as a shepherd. 
and his people as sheep. No other illustration is more fitting to illustrate God's care for his children. Just as sheep need the shepherd's guidance and protection while they are led up to mountain paths, man needs God's guidance and care in order to be led in the narrow paths of life and to find his way in a vast universe. When a flock has a good shepherd, there is no fear of sheep getting lost or any lack of grass and water, and the sheep follow him. Likewise, when man relies upon and trusts in God for his spiritual needs and guidance, his daily bread will be supplied. He will hear the voice of the men of God and will be led into spiritual understanding and comfort, just as sheep are guided, guided and led into green virgin pastures and places where water is abundant. On the other hand, sheep without a good shepherd cannot get directions, so they scatter and are lost, and become the prey of thieves and wild beasts. Man without divine guidance is also led astray by false prophets and teachers, who, like some of the hired shepherds, work for their own interest and betray their followers during times of need. Sheep, more than any other animal, are timid and fearful. They are, they are very sensitive to the voices of strangers and are even disturbed by the rustling of dry grass. Moreover, sheep have to be led by the shepherd to the pastures, water, shade, and the fold. People without a spiritual leader are often depicted as sheep without a shepherd. Israel went astray like sheep when she had no leader. Spiritual leaders, prophets, and apostles are called shepherds. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. He instructed his apostles to go and seek the lost sheep of Israel, that is, the ten tribes which had gone astray and were carried captive by the Assyrians. After his resurrection, he told Peter to feed his female sheep, his lambs and his rams. That is to be the chief shepherd and take care of the entire flock, which is symbolic of men, women, and children. Mm. It's beautiful. George Lamza grew up in a very um, remote part of the world, in a region known as Kurdistan. And that's a region um, that covers an area from upper Iraq through, upper, through lower Turkey. He came from the Iraq part of that. And growing up, that region, because it was so remote, it was actually just separated from, because of how isolated it was geographically, until World War I and the overthrow of the Ottoman Empire, it was kept separated, kept separated from the rest of, of the world. And so things didn't change in that area for hundreds of years. And that gave him the opportunity to understand much of the Bible culture because in many ways it was unchanged. Lambs is known even more than for his knowledge of Eastern customs and idioms. He's known for his work in Aramaic and for his Aramaic translation, which was still a spoken language where he grew up, although at that time thought to be a dead language. At any rate, he grew up and one of the, he worked as a shepherd. And this book is a great little book because of his understanding of sheep and shepherds and of that culture. Having that background, that understanding in mind, as we get into John chapter 10, I think that it will become even more uh, real, living for you. You can turn to John 10 and verse 1, where Jesus Christ begins, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door or gate into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. 
But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And they were prey to those who would try to, to steal them. Those thieves and robbers that would come in. And they wouldn't come in for the door. You know, they were thieves. They, they came in sneakily. They came in by cover of night. They came in to come and, and snatch away those sheep and to lead them away. But the one that enters in the door is the shepherd. Verse 3. To him the porter openeth, the gatekeeper. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. That is such a beautiful and profound truth. The sheep know his voice. The sheep hear his voice. The sheep follow him. And Jesus Christ will talk about that more as he then makes known that he is the good shepherd. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. You know, sheep are, are very intelligent animals. When I was watching that shepherd working with the sheep, and those dogs, they were well trained, and they would move in certain ways, and they didn't have to actually chase the sheep. The sheep just recognized by the different positions that they took what, what, what they were supposed to do. If they were supposed to go up the hill or down the hill or all kind of come together or come back into the fold, come back into the sheepfold. The shepherd that works with the sheep, they know his voice and he has different commands and they recognize those. And it says that he knows them by name, that he can call each one. You know, my dog knows her name. If I call Susanna, she's smart enough to know that I'm calling her. If I call Loretta's dog Daisy, she knows that that's her name. Or I call McGregor, my son's dog. They all know their names. Well, the sheep were like that. They were all named, just like you name your pets. The shepherd had a name for each one of those sheep. And that relationship of the shepherd with the sheep was every bit as tender as the relationship that we have in our culture with our pets, with our cats and dogs and so forth. They loved their sheep. They loved them and they took care of them and they were important to them. And the sheep recognized that and appreciated that and had a loyalty to that shepherd just like a good dog will have a loyalty to its owner. It said that a stranger they wouldn't follow, but will flee from him in verse 5, for they know not the voice of strangers. The sheep that are being shepherded, they won't follow the voice of a stranger. They will flee from him. And the ones that are the sheep of the shepherd will only follow him. If you went to a place where they had sheep and you're a stranger there and you try giving the same commands, those sheep won't pay a bit of attention to you. They'll completely ignore you because they don't know your voice. You mean nothing to them. You're not the boss of them. But the shepherd, they'll follow his. Verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they, they were which he spake unto them. And that's not unusual when Jesus spoke parables, that people didn't always get it. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, 
but the sheep did not hear them. All the ones that came before him, the ones that came in claiming to be him, the ones that came saying that they were the Messiah, the ones that came saying they were the leaders, the ones that came saying they were prophets for God when they were false prophets, all of those were thieves and robbers. They came because they wanted to use those people. They wanted to take advantage of them. They wanted to use them for their own gain. They wanted them to follow them for the sake of their own greed or, or gain in some way. And all that came before Jesus, he said, were just thieves and robbers, but his sheep did not follow them. Verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be what? Saved. Saved. And he shall go in and out and find pasture. Those that came in by him, those that came to the Father through Jesus Christ, those were saved, those would be saved. And they would go in and out and find pasture. Pasture, that place where they would be cared for. That place where they would be fed. Fed spiritually. Where they would have their needs taken care of. Where they would receive that spiritual nutrition. And they would have that protection that the Good Shepherd would give them. Verse 10. A very familiar verse. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to what? Destroy. The thief comes only for those reasons, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And the thief that he is most specifically and especially talking about in this verse is the adversary, the devil. That he was the thief. There are many that came that he had sent that were thieves and robbers, but he was the master thief and that thief the adversary his only purpose all that he wants to do to people is to steal to kill and to destroy to steal everything they have not just their material abundance but to steal their peace to steal their joy to steal away their dreams to steal everything that they hold dear and if he can do that he will and if he can, he will kill them. And short of killing them, he'll make them so sick and miserable that they'll wish they were dead. That's what the adversary does. That's what the thief does. Mm. And to destroy goes even beyond kill. To destroy is to mm. destroy them spiritually. Mm. That they would never have eternal life and so that they would be eternally destroyed. That's what the thief came to do. And boy, until Jesus Christ came, he was having a pretty good time doing it. He had pretty free reign for all of those thousands of years. He caused a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble. And he defeated the children of Israel on every hand. But when Jesus Christ came, it says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. He came to give life and to give it more abundantly. That we can have a more than abundant life because of what he did. That was his purpose. That was his purpose. Most people don't know that. Most people don't recognize that. And even those that do too often forget it. Too often people forget that Jesus Christ made that available. He accomplished that for us. That we have the right to the more than abundant life. That's ours. That's what the Good Shepherd gave. I am the Good Shepherd, verse 11. And the Good Shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. The Good Shepherd gave his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, 
and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. The one that wasn't the shepherd, the one who wasn't really the shepherd over those sheep, who was just a hired hand, why, he wasn't going to risk his life. When the wolves came, he would flee. He'd run away. He'd leave those sheep at the mercy of those wolves. But the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep. It reminds me of, the, of another good shepherd, that one being David. And David, he was a shepherd. Before he was ever king, he was a shepherd. And he loved his sheep. And he took such great care of them. Such great care of them that one day when a lion came and wanted to eat those sheep, he grabbed them by the old beard and hit them and killed them. And when a bear came along and wanted to eat the sheep, he did the same thing. He was willing to literally risk his life, a boy, still a boy, to take care of those sheep because that's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd is willing to risk his life. A good shepherd lays down his life, not necessarily having to do that physically, but any good shepherd will lay down his life in service for his people. And Jesus Christ was that good shepherd. He wasn't just some hireling. There's lots that are just hirelings. There are a lot of men and women that are over, have responsibility for the care of God's people. And they're like that hireling. When trouble comes along, they're not to be found. Or when, when they're not, no longer getting paid to do it, well, they've moved on to greener pastures for themselves. But that's not the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd, 14, and know my sheep and have known of mine. He knows his sheep and they know him. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus Christ knew the Father, and he was known of the Father. And he was willing and soon would lay down his life for his sheep. He was willing to give his life for his sheep so that they could have life. And those sheep, those that were his sheep, heard his voice. Many did not hear his voice. Many were goats. Many that he taught. Many that he served and did signs, miracles, and wonders amongst. They didn't hear his voice. They didn't know him because they were not his sheep. And the same is true today. His sheep still hear his voice. His sheep hear his voice and they will follow. They will follow that shepherd because they know that shepherd loves them and will take care of them. Verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, meaning Israel, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. This is one of those times where, even as he spoke the words, because Jesus himself did not know the great mystery that was to come, he didn't fully understand the full depth of what he was saying. He spoke the words that God gave him to speak. Verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. The Father loved him because he was willing to do that. The Father loved him. He loved him, period. But that Jesus Christ had that kind of love himself, the love for the Father and the love for the sheep of Israel, that he was willing to do that, made God love him all the more. He lay, said, Because I laid on my life that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me, 
but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The, this commandment have I received of my Father. No man took it from him. The soldiers that arrested Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane never could have arrested him if he had not just let himself be taken. When they took him and beat him, they couldn't have done that with all of the force that they had and, and all the army that was there if he had any minute said, no, I'm out of here. When he was nailed to that cross, they could have never nailed him to that cross if he was not willing to let them do it. And he could have come down at that, off of that cross at any minute. And those were his words as he hung on the cross. That at that very moment that he could have called on six legions of angels to come along and just clean house and get him off of that cross. But he hung there. He hung there and he was willing to endure all of that suffering. He was willing to endure all of that pain. He was willing to endure all of that humiliation. To do all of that for one reason, because he so loved. He so loved. And not only did he so love, but the Father so loved that he sent him. Turn to John chapter 3, and this is where we'll close. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave his son. That was a son that always did his will. A son that was perfect. A son that he loved with greater love than any of us fathers have ever even loved our sons. That was the love that the father had. And yet God's love for the entire world was so great that he gave him so that we could have life everlasting. God bless you.